I think I can pick up something visual. Put it on the screen. Director Enterprise, lock on transporters, beam us up. Space. It would take all the power of our main phaser banks to do it. Final frontier. Live long and prosper. I think I'm going to get space. Ah! I'm a doctor, not a bricklayer. I'm standing here wondering. What? You must see the rest of the transmission. It's a series that that uh, that was made in spite of a lot of things, in spite of uh, lack of interest on the part of the network, in spite of terrible budgets, uh, in spite of of uh, the fact that it was trying to be really good science fiction at a time when Lost in Space was was the, the nature of science fiction being done successfully. It certainly, was a big gamble for Desilu. Who had never before faced the kind of needs that a, a sci-fi show like this engenders? We made those series then for, uh, and this is not an exaggeration, probably the catering bill for a series made today, for what it costs to feed the crew, cast and crew, for uh, a week and a half. That's what we made an hour show on. Nobody expected the show to take off years later, so they weren't spending much money on this. It almost shouldn't have been done. It's, it's, it's a series that, that, that was made in spite of all of these problems, in spite of itself, in a sense. Green! Did you see this? Yes, sir. Sturgeon was dead when I found him. I was circling to find whatever it was. Same red rings on his face. The man trap was chosen by the network and there, therefore also by the studio because they wanted the network to be happy and uh, we had not very many other better ideas, uh, including one of which was mine for a show called The Naked Time. I felt that The Naked Time would display our characters uh, to best advantage and uh, give the audience an idea of who the show is about. But I got shot down and, uh, and we went with Man Trap and The Salt Eater and uh, a good time was had by all. It was pretty much, you know, what have you got, and uh, then we make a choice. And well, that's what we've got. Uh, they didn't realize just how poverty-stricken we were when it came to viewable episodes, because uh, we were really up against it uh, for time. I'm in control of my emotions. The others believe that. I don't. The Naked Time uh, was challenging. It was an episode where a, a virus was brought on board accidentally that was passed person to person by touch. If I had it and shook your hand, you got it. And what it did was eliminated people's defenses. So they started acting out their personal fantasies or secrets or whatever. Uh, Sulu became a swordsman, dashing around with his, with his saber and attacking people. In most of the episodes, I was just anchored there at the uh, console. And my lines were, you know, pretty much uh, pre-written for me and pre-memorized before the script even arrived. I, I, sir, warp three, you know. I mean, but with this script, Naked Time, I got unchained. Drunkenness without staggering and slurring. Uh, no, that was the essence of the story. If you think about it, that's what happened. Uh, People did goofy things, racing around like a drunk would do. John Black, the writer who wrote that script, happened to be on the set, uh, oh, about a month before we, that uh, episode was shot. And he told me that he was uh, thinking of putting a, a samurai sword in my hand to terrorize the rest of the crew because of the virus that tore down our inhibitions. And I told him, well, that's uh, interesting. And it's certainly ethnically consistent because I'm of Japanese ancestry. But I told him, you know, I'm um, a Japanese American. I grew up here and I didn't play samurai when I was a kid. I uh, played Robin Hood. Uh, so what about a fencing foil in uh, Sulu's hand? John said, well, that's a great idea. Do you fence? I said, of course. <laughs> It's my favorite hobby. 
That night, I had the yellow pages open and looking down fencing schools. I found one on Hollywood Boulevard, the Falcon Studios, and that Saturday, I was taking my first formal uh, fencing lesson. My life had come full circle, and I was able to bring that two weeks worth of uh, frenzied fencing lesson taking to that episode. I am in control of my emotions. Control of my emotions. The first draft of the script that came down, as I recall, had Spock, uh, elevator door opens, and out comes Spock, who's got the bug now, and Spock is crying. And a crewman, who's being kind of silly and painting graffiti on the walls in the, in the ship, has a paintbrush, dips in the paintbrush, and paints a mustache on the crying Spock. And Spock walks down the hall crying. I understood it, but I thought it was a lost opportunity. And this gentleman came on the set and said, OK, tell me again what you have in mind. I said, look. All you have to do is put me in a room by myself. Let me walk in a room, close the door behind me because Spock would like some privacy when this is happening to him. And give me some words that have to do with science and emotion and mother and love. So he put some words down with just about pretty much what I just said. Mark Daniels, wonderful director, had devised a shot that was kind of complicated where the camera moved around me, kind of encircled me and, and come up on the other side and see my face and the tears are streaming and I'm in this struggle. There wasn't time to do this more than once. Adjustments behind the camera, creeping, watching, you know, and I could feel him out of the corner of my eye as I'm playing the scene. And uh, we got it done. When that show went on the air, my, my mail just went like that. It really uh, resonated with people. They really got it. They knew what, what it was all about. It was like they were let in on the secret of Spock's life. And they cared about it, and they responded to it. It was a tremendously important episode for Spock. <laughs> Part of the attraction of Star Trek, I thought, were the action sequences. They always are. You aim for an audience, and maybe there are the cliché uh, observation that maybe women of a certain age wouldn't like action sequences, but then we are filled with clichés, and especially back then even more. I loved the idea of setting up action sequences, and in these fights that we would have with these monsters of you know, the aliens uh, since they were capable of different things we had to outwit them it pushed us the the people making the series to think of new and different ways to fight and have action sequences in which we could compensate for our lack of brawn with brain or if they were brainier with our brawn we are dealing with a silicon creature of the deep rocks capable of moving through solid rock as easily as we move through the air. That would account for the tunnels. Correct. Devil in the Dark, an, an excellent episode. It was about something important for me. It was about the way we tend to demonize the things that we don't know or understand, or the people that we don't know or understand. Captain, you're aware of the Vulcan technique of the joining of two minds. You think you can get through that thing? Possible. It was complicated because Bill Shatner's father died during the making of that episode. And he had to go off to Florida to uh, deal with uh, the funeral and what have you. While he was gone, I was doing this contact with the Horda, doing this mind meld where I'm getting in touch with what it's experiencing. And we have shot it and it's in pain. And I'm, re I'm experiencing that pain with it and I'm I don't remember exactly how I did it, but it was something like, pain, pain, something like that. Maybe bigger than that. And Bill was not there. Pain! Now he came back two or three days later, and now it's time to put the camera on him. There was one shot where they shot across a double's shoulder. So you thought that Bill was in the scene while I'm doing that, but it was not Bill, it was a double. But now the camera has to turn around, we have to see Bill reacting to this. So he comes back and we turn the camera around on him. And he said, well, can Leonard show me what he did? I said, sure, I'll show you. So I walk over to the position and I, I, do, I said, it was something like this, Bill was pain, pain. And he said, uh, is that exactly the way you did it? I said, no, not exactly. 
Well, show me exactly what you did. Pain. Pain. Now he said, let me, let me see what you really did. So, Pain. Pain. And Bill is devilish with a gleam in his eye, turns to the crew and says, would somebody give this guy an aspirin? He just sucked me right into it, you know, <laughs> having a good time with me. I wanted to kill him. <laughs> well, uh, Bill had that kind of a warped sense of humor. This is 13 years ago. The Enterprise. And its commander, Captain Christopher Pike. We were running short of scripts. And I used to watch the progress of the scripts through the story and teleplay procedure. I realized that we would soon be out of scripts to film, and if something didn't occur, we'd have to, quote, shut down, unquote. Oh my God, what a terrible thing to even contemplate. But that's what was going to happen. And at that time, I went to Gene, and uh, I don't know whether he knew it was coming or not. I said, Gene, either you write what, we, what he described as the envelope, or we shut down. Well, that was a job and a half. I worked on it very, very hard uh, to try and put new stuff with old stuff because we couldn't waste that first pilot. So Gene said, make it work. It was a really tough job. And one of the toughest jobs I think I've had. Mr. Spock had related to us your strength of will. We need the breathing space that two finished scripts can give us so we can get the rest of our shows done writing and into production. He could not face the issue and he went home and he stayed in the office and he wrote for I don't remember how many days it was and he was delivered of the sandwich episodes and we had two more scripts that we could use and we made it. We came within a week of failing to meet our air date. And that happened time after time that first season. Khan is my name. Khan, nothing else. Khan. The original episode that I um, had the pleasure of, which I had the pleasure to work, Space Seed, God, so many years ago, I remember as being rather intimate. I remember having a very good eye-to-eye -eye contact with Bill Shatner. The atmosphere was very pleasant. The text seemed to me that it was ahead of its time. It was interesting to do. Captain, although your abilities intrigue me, you are quite honestly inferior, mentally, physically. In fact, I am surprised how little improvement there has been in human evolution, or there has been technical advancement, but uh, how little man himself has changed. Khan was a super, superman, really. Superior strength, superior intellect. When it came to love, love became a very simple, beautiful thing to him. And that's what I found fascinating about the man. I have played many, many different kinds of roles because after I left MGM, I was um, left alone to fend from, by myself and support my family. So I had to do all kinds of things, including I did any number of television appearances. In every time, I portray a character never thinking that if he's a gangster or a killer, or, never think he's evil. I'm sure that the worst criminal in the world doesn't think of himself as being evil. I think perhaps I, I was able to achieve a certain, if not vulnerability, at least some kind of humanity in the character. You must excuse my whimsical way of fetching you here. But when I saw you passing by, I simply could not resist. Well, I got a call from Gene Kuhn, and I didn't know him. And I wondered, what is this guy calling me for? And he informed me that he had a part for me. But he wanted to talk to me first because there was a fellow by the name of Joe Agosta who was the casting, and he didn't think I could do it. He said, Bill Campbell is a tough guy from New Jersey, and uh, he's done a lot of war pictures, uh, Battle Cry, The Naked and the Dead, and things like that. 
He said, but I don't see him uh, in, in this part. He sends me the, the script and I started reading it. And I said, holy Christ. I mean, <laughs> this is a great role. An actor's dream. I digested it that night. I practically knew it by heart. If it's fighting that you want, you may have it. Are you challenging me to a duel? If you have the courage. Oh, this is better than I'd planned. I shall not shirk an affair of honor. Of all the things I've done, and I won't say one is better than the other, but in that group, of all the s series I've done, the uh, Star Trek episodes are the most fun uh, in my lifetime. I will never have another part like the Squire. Never. One day soon, man is going to be able to harness incredible energies, maybe even the atom, energies that could ultimately hurl us to other worlds in, in some sort of spaceship. I think uh, City on the Edge of Forever uh, was another very poetic, wonderful script by Harlan and Ellison, which I thought was very special, very good. Great love story for Bill Shatner with Joan Collins. And a script that did not have a happy ending. Uh, his love dies, and he has to let it happen. Tragic ending, in which he finally, he, I think his final line is, let's get the hell out of here. It was good tragedy, if there is such a thing. Good dramatic construction, where the tragic event is in inevitable, has to happen. And uh, well written, and, and well, uh, well produced, and directed. I believe it was written that way. The awe that uh, it engendered wasn't. You know, we all were suitably impressed. And uh, I just remember the sh th that setup where the three of them jumped through the hoop, so to speak, and disappeared into the past, or, you know, or possibly the future. It was, uh, it was an amazing moment. I imagine it came from the set description, but it was an odd looking thing. It, we called it, I think we called it the donut. And it was very mysterious looking. And, uh, you know, you could really believe for the first time I felt that this is a true science fiction show. It had, but, the, but that episode had everything. And uh, it, it is rightfully so uh, the belief by most of the fans that it was the best episode of the whole three years of the series. Spark. I believe I'm in love with Edith Keeler. Jim, Edith Keeler must die. The best episodes of Star Trek reached for a universal something that resonated, uh, a feeling that we all have. And uh, there, everybody's had the feeling, gosh, I wish I could go back and fix that. And of course you can't. And regret is the worst of human emotions because there's nothing you can do about it. So there we went back in time and tried to do something about it. No, Jim! you get if you feed a triple too much a fat triple to trouble triples was so much fun but the trouble we had with triples was keeping a straight face it was just a lot of fun well i remember when the uh, first story outline came in at that time it was entitled a fuzzy thing happened and it stayed with that title for a while and gave me no end of worry these are are totally inexplicably little alien animals. And it's, it's based on an idea from an old story called Pigs is Pigs. I don't know if you've ever read it. A British story where somebody sends a couple of guinea pigs by rail somewhere. They get held up because the people won't get let it through either as pigs. They have no idea what a guinea pig is. And while they're going through all the paperwork, of course, the, the guinea pigs are becoming a population explosion. I gave them a very good home, sir. Where? I gave them to the Klingons, sir. I gave them to the Klingons. 
Aye, sir. Before they went into warp, I transported the whole kit and caboodle into the air engine room, where there'll be no trouble at all. It was the f uh, first and maybe only comedy we did was The Trouble with Tribbles. How long have you had that thing, Lieutenant? Since yesterday, Doctor. This morning I found out that he... <laughs> I mean, she had had babies. I take them back, a couple of them back on the ship, and um, the only problem was that they're born pregnant. <laughs> and we were carrying a load, a shipload of um, Quattro Triticale wheat from one place to another is the most important thing. And they get into it and that's their favorite food. And they just multiply like crazy. I felt that it went too far comedically and it worried me about believability. I felt it was just a little bit too caricaturish, and uh, it did worry me up until the time the show aired and we got the response, and it seemed like everybody liked it. And uh, so my, my worst fears got banished, thankfully, uh, and uh, the cast did a wonderful job. Uh, Bill was very funny, and everyone was very funny. One of the funnier things that was happening is they were having a terrible time with uh, when the trap door opened and dumped all the tribbles on uh, Captain Kirk. Well, the tribbles, they wanted a pile of them for like looking like thousands, but the tribbles would hit the floor and spread out. So they put him, they did everything they could to try to like put wads of newspaper around him. And the tribbles would just hit the newspapers and bounce away. <laughs> So finally, they put him in a box and filled that box with a whole bunch of soft stuff. And when the Tribbles came out, they filled the box and came over. And uh, that, was, that was finally what they did. Well, the stagehands, of course, loved it because they got to open a trap door and dump 600 Tribbles on William Shatner about 20 times <laughs> during that day. There was one scene I, I remember that piled the tribbles up on top of me. I, somehow they fell out of an overhead bin or something, and I was above my rear end and probably up to my neck in tribbles. And then the stagehands all had tribbles for him. And they pelt me with tribbles. So in the middle of the dialogue, a tribble would land on me, and I knew that, you know, one of, the, one of my friends up there in the flies had thrown them. And we had uh, triple ball fights afterwards. We just throw triples at each other. So the the the, the triples was was one of those shows that had such humor. Uh, it was a good joke. It was a good joke all the way along. The, the people would sit there and throw these last little triples, and he couldn't say a thing. He couldn't even look up there and go. <laughs> you know, nothing. There was nothing he could do. And uh, I'm glad he remembers that story, too, because he, he finally, of course, enjoyed the humor in it. Some of the tribbles, you may be surprised to learn, were, uh, were capable of motion. Uh, they had some sort of a little motor set up in them, and they would kind of tremble and, uh, and quake. Uh, and for the rest of the movement, we had to depend upon the actors to uh, surreptitiously move them around. First we're going to Vulcan, then we're going to Altair, then we're headed to Vulcan again, and now we're headed back to Altair. I think I'm going to get spacesick. Gene handed me a batch of scripts for the second season, with much more to, uh, for uh, Sulu to do. A, a few very uh, interesting things and, and a couple of even exciting things for Sulu to do in episodes like Trouble with Tribbles, uh, wonderful things for Sulu to do. And so I took the script with me and I had my lines memorized uh, while working on the Green Berets. Unfortunately, we had bad weather and all, a lot of other difficulties and uh, the filming of the Green Berets went way beyond um, the uh, schedule when I was supposed to be back in Hollywood to begin the uh, second season of, uh, of Star Trek. And so I missed out on a whole hunk of episodes. George Takei says that uh, 
that when I came on, he felt it was a bit of an intrusion and that I had usurped him because he was away and uh, several of the episodes had been originally written for him. They had to rewrite for me. So here's this guy that, you know, comes in from left field, uh, sailing in on, on pure good luck. He was a little unsettled by that and felt, uh, you know, some uh, animosity toward me. And steals everything that I was looking forward to. I never saw that. He's either an extremely good actor or he has exaggerated his own venal behavior because uh, I only remember him as being a very nice, nice fellow. It's kind of uh, ironic that uh, a guy that, uh, who, a relationship that started out in hatred became a very good friendship. Report, mister. I am only picking up physical impulses from the three of them. The Davy Jones thing is quite true. They were looking for somebody who would create the same kind of following that uh, Davy Jones and the Monkees had. And I've never met him, but I don't think we would look that much alike, or we would have even then. But there was that sense that um, I was cut from the same Im image, which is quite ironic because I'm probably at least 10 years older than he is. That was the idea, and my, my mail was generally from people from age 8 to 14 years old. That's generally the, the mail that I got. And that's, that was the demographic they were looking for. We didn't have any young characters uh, in the cast at that time. In other words, the actors were upwards of 30 uh, on average. And the Beatles were hot at that point still. Of course, they had been hot for a while. Gene Roddenberry decided that we need a young character in here to just add that younger point of view and give a little freshness and maybe a little um, arrogance of youth in, into the script. So uh, he brought in a Russian and it became Chekhov. And uh, they cast and they wound up with Walter Koenig, who I think was wonderful. Does everybody know about the suite but me? Well, not everyone, Captain. It's a Russian invention. Oh. The Russian I was playing was not a very controversial Russian, you know. Um, he, he made jokes about things being invented in Russia, and that was about the only reference we made. And as I say, my mail was all mostly, you know, in pencil and lined paper from, you know, very young kids. I don't remember ever getting any mail about what are you doing with a commie on your show or something of that nature, even though that was certainly the period of the Cold War. But I think it, it speaks to the fact that uh, he, the character was not portrayed in a way that would engender those kinds of reactions. We were trying to find the place for him, and, and a young romance was always popular, so we, we tried that. Uh, but I think one of the things that was always nice about him was the fact that he was always coming up with something Russian that someone else, you know, someone Russian had done first. Anytime you talk about some significant uh, achievement or, you know, a philosophy or whatever, it was always Russian. <laughs> if I could give the transfusion without loss of time or efficiency, I would. Sarek understands my reason. Well, I don't. It's not human. Oh, that's not a dirty word. You're human, too. Let that part of you come through. The ones I wrote, I think my absolute personal favorite is Journey to Babel, because it went into the Vulcan relationships between families. I think that it's a story that's universal and timeless, that communication between parents and children. And that, to me, was the big story. The rest of it was an adventure, it was a spy story, it was a mystery, it was an action story. But all in all, it was really about the parents and the child. And of course, it was a grown-up child and grown-up parents. In other words, you know, Sarek was 102 at the time. But um, uh, there still had been a vast lack of communication between them and they needed to find each other as parent and child. Do you want to know how I feel about your logic? Emotional, isn't she? She has always been that way. Indeed. Why did you marry her? At the time, it seemed the logical thing to do. Mark had a real sense of the dignity and authority that the character needed. Jane was very human, which was exactly what that character needed. They were terrific together. They asked me about any suggestions that I had about, about the Balkans, how to deal with the Balkan ideas. And I said that I, I thought, you know, I had introduced this by that time, and I had introduced the neck pinch into Star Trek, and, and uh, I said, I've kind of, it seems to me uh, that I have kind of come around to thinking that the Vulcans in some way are hand-oriented people. There's a lot that has to do with their hands. And I said, maybe you and Jane could find a way to demonstrate that when you walk together or when you work together. And they ended up doing this 
to each other's hands as they walked. Instead of holding hands, they touched fingers, which was a, oh, I thought it was a wonderful touch. Spock, I'm asking you, what's wrong? I need rest. I'm asking you to accept that answer. I remember that one very well. An excellent script. Very, very uh, poetic, very dramatic, intense, and important, I felt immediately, for Spock and the Balkans, because it was the first time we we're going to go to Balkan, first time we we're going to see other Balkans. We had never seen any other Balkans show up to that point. And uh, Live Long and Prosper was written in that script by Theodore Sturgeon for the very first time we ever used those words. Live long, Tipau, and prosper. Live long and prosper, Spock. I shall do neither. I have killed my captain and my friend. There was the scene where I was to meet Tipau, the leader of the Vulcan people, a uh, very dignified, regal, wonderful lady, uh, Celia Lofsky, the actress, played her beautifully, great stature, importance. And when we first meet, I thought we should have some special kind of greeting. So I suggested to the, to the uh, director that we, that we do this, and he went for it. We had a little trouble because she couldn't do it. She said, <laughs> We worked it out. We got her uh, 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 to the point where she, she held her hand in the proper shape with her other hand out of the sight of the camera. So when I raised my hand, she was ready and she raised hers. And that's how we got that done into the show. And there was that wonderful payoff where, where I believed that I had killed Kirk. And, uh, and she says to me, live long and prosperous, Spock. And I said, I shall do neither. I've killed my captain and my friend. Great moment. Beautiful writing, you know. There can be no excuse for the crime of which I'm guilty. I intend to offer no defense. Furthermore, I shall order Mr. Scott to take immediate command of this vessel. Don't you think you better check with me first? Captain. <laughs> Jim! And, and then we're on the ship, and I'm, I'm telling McCoy that he has to take charge because I'm gonna resign. I can't continue as an officer on this ship. And in walks Bill Shatner as Kirk and Spock smiles, you know, for a moment. <laughs> it was a very, very exciting episode to, to shoot and perform. It was uh, so beautifully written and, and great casting of, of the other people. It was very good. Mirror, Mirror was a wonderful uh, episode in which you got a reflection of an alternate planet in which we being the good guys, that planet was in, the, in our alternate universe, the negative. Bill Tice designed these costumes which were two piece and Uhura's belly button was going to show. Oh, horrors. Now, where anyone got the idea that viewing poor Jeannie's belly button or Uhura's belly button was going to absolutely destroy the masculine morals of this country, I don't know, but there we are. And so, to get away with that, I took the quality control person to lunch, because I was on the set that day, and Jean says, you know, take her to the executive commissary. And while we had lunch, this sash, which had actually been up around Uhura's waist, was folded down about three times and retied, and so we get a lovely Uhura belly button uh, showing, and it got by everybody, and, you know, appeared on the screen, and so far as we know, it did not cause one single breakdown in morality anywhere. Mirror, mirror, we got the chance to be the very polar opposite, uh, a dark, evil, cutthroat, conniving, totally amoral, ambitious, lustful. The Sulu that we know and love has a fondness and affection and discipline, controlled and polite and civilized. Well, the uh, character in uh, Mirror Mirror doesn't have any of that at all. And he ha he's able to express his raw heat. There came a time when our 
weapons grew faster than our wisdom, and we almost destroyed ourselves. We learned from this to make a rule during all our travels. Never to cause the same to happen to other worlds. We had the uh, overarching authority of science fiction, and we could go anywhere with that. And under that guise, we could also talk about the issues of the day. And there were a lot of things going on. We had seen a president assassinated. We had seen a senator running for president assassinated. We'd seen the governor of Alabama uh, you know, critically injured. We had seen race riots. We had seen riots on campuses. We had seen so much going on. The war in Vietnam, which no one was allowed to talk about on television if you had a contemporary show. But under science fiction, we were able to get in commentary on Vietnam. So. Under that guise, we tackled a lot of issues, cloaked them in science fiction, and did our stories anyway. The only thing that's truly yours is the rest of humanity. That's where our duty lies. Do you understand me? It came at a time when the entire world was in turmoil. There was the Cold War, and one didn't know who the enemy was or the, was identified as the USSR. But he said, no, we didn't do that. We didn't push the button and go boom. We transcended that foolishness. We reflected the times. Uh, in fact, one of the things that I think we're most uh, we are most respected for is how topical we were, not only in terms of fads, but in terms of issues, you know, social and political issues. I think all of that is, it's been, you know, covered many, many times uh, that we used uh, the, we used science fiction and the future to, um, to mask uh, discussion uh, of, uh, of uh, topics and issues and uh, things that were going on that uh, really needed to be addressed and weren't because people were timorous about doing so. I loved any of the episodes in which the various characters uh, were able to interact with one another uh, and advance the storyline at the same time. We were the first ensemblist cast, but Hollywood was not quite ready for it. And we became international heroes to people. Do you remember the 20th century brush wars on the Asian continent? Two giant powers involved much like the Klingons and ourselves. Neither side felt that they could pull out? Yes, I remember. It went on bloody year after bloody year. Well, I think every writer's dream is to just write the best stories they can and have them remembered. Uh, I think some of mine are, and that's my pleasure. What I wanted to give to the audience was my young understanding at the time of humanity, because remember, I was in my 20s, uh, what I understood of the world and um, what Gene Roddenberry's message was, was, was that we are all human beings together. And uh, if we're going to have this world survive, we have to go there together. It's a series that, that, uh, that was made in spite of a lot of things, in spite of uh, lack of interest on the part of the network, in spite of terrible budgets, uh, in spite of, of uh, the fact that it was trying to be really good science fiction at a time when Lost in Space was, was the, the nature of science fiction being done successfully. It certainly was a big gamble for Desilu, uh, who had never before faced the kind of needs that a, a sci-fi show like this engenders. We made those series then for uh, and this is not an exaggeration, probably the catering bill for a series made today, for what it costs to feed the crew, cast and crew, for uh, a week and a half. That's what we made an hour show on. Nobody expected the show to take off years later, so they weren't spending much money on it. It almost shouldn't have been done. It's, it's, it's a series that, that, that was made in spite of all of these problems, in spite of itself, in a sense. Green! Did you see this? Yes, sir. Sturgeon was dead when I found him. I was circling to find whatever it was. Same red rings on his face. The man trap was chosen by the network and therefore also by the studio because they wanted the network to be happy and we had 
not very many other better ideas, uh, including one of which was mine for a show called The Naked Time. I felt that The Naked Time would display our characters uh, to best advantage and uh, give the audience an idea of who the show is about. But I got shot down and, uh, and we went with Man Trap and the Salt Eater and uh, a good time was had by all. It was pretty much, you know, what have you got? And uh, then we make a choice. And well, that's what we've got. Uh, they didn't realize just how poverty stricken we were when it came to viewable episodes. Because uh, we were really up against it uh, for time. I'm in control of my emotions. The others believe that I don't. The Naked Time uh, was challenging. It was an episode where a, a, a virus was brought on board accidentally that was passed person to person by touch. If I had it and shook your hand, you got it. And what it did was eliminated people's defenses. So they started acting out their personal fantasies or secrets or whatever. Uh, Sulu became a swordsman, dashing around with his, with his saber and attacking people. In most of the episodes, I was just anchored there at the uh, console. And my lines were, you know, pretty much uh, pre-written for me and pre-memorized before he, this the script even arrived. I, I, sir, warp three, you know. I mean, but with this script, Naked Time, I got unchained. Drunkenness without staggering and slurring. Uh, no, that was the essence of the story. If you think about it, that's what happened. Uh, People did goofy things, racing around like a drunk would do. John Black, the writer who wrote that script, happened to be on the set, uh, oh, about a month before we, that uh, episode was shot. And he told me that he was uh, thinking of putting a, a samurai sword in my hand to terrorize the rest of the crew because of the virus that tore down our inhibitions. And I told him, well, that's uh, interesting. And it's certainly ethnically consistent because I'm of Japanese ancestry. But I told him, you know, I'm um, a Japanese American. I grew up here and I didn't play samurai when I was a kid. I uh, played Robin Hood. Uh, so what about a fencing foil in uh, Sulu's hand? John said, well, that's a great idea. Do you fence? I said, of course. <laughs> it's my favorite hobby. <laughs> that night, I had the yellow pages open and looking down fencing uh, schools. I found one on Hollywood Boulevard, the Falcon Studios. And that Saturday, I was taking my first formal uh, fencing lesson. My life had come full circle. And I was able to bring that two weeks worth of uh, frenzied fencing lesson taking to that episode. I am in control of my emotions. <sighs> control of my emotions. The first draft of the script that came down, as I recall, had Spock, uh, elevator door opens, and out comes Spock, who's got the bug now, and Spock is crying. And a brewman, who's being kind of silly and painting graffiti on the walls in the in the ship has a paintbrush dips in the paintbrush and paints a mustache on the crying Spock and Spock walks down the hall crying I understood it but I thought it was a lost opportunity and this gentleman came on the set and said okay tell me again what you have in mind I said look all you have to do is put me in a room by myself let me walk in a room close the door behind me because Spock would like some privacy when this is happening to him and give me some words that have to do with science and emotion and mother and love. So he put some words down with just about pretty much what I just said. Mark Daniels, wonderful director, had devised a shot that was kind of complicated where the camera moved around me, kind of encircled me and, and come up on the other side and see my face and the tears are streaming and I'm in this struggle. There wasn't time to do this more than once. Adjustments behind the camera creeping, watching, you know, and I could feel them out of the corner of my eye as I'm playing the scene. And uh, we got it done. When that show went on the air, my, my mail just went like that. 
it really uh, resonated with people. They really got it. They knew what, what it was all about. It was like they were let in on the secret of Spock's life. And they cared about it, and they responded to it. It was a tremendously important episode for Spock. <laughs> Part of the attraction of Star Trek, I thought, were the action sequences. They always are. You aim for an audience, and maybe there are the cliché uh, observation that maybe women of a certain age wouldn't like action sequences, but then we are filled with clichés, especially back then even more. I loved the idea of setting up action sequences, and in these fights that we would have with these monsters of the aliens uh, since they were capable of different things we had to outwit them it pushed us the the people making the series to think of new and different ways to fight and have action sequences in which we could compensate for our lack of brawn with brain or if they were brainier with our brawn we are dealing with a silicon creature of the deep rocks Capable of moving through solid rock as easily as we move through the air. That would account for the tunnels. Correct. Devil in the Dark, an, an excellent episode. It was about something important for me. It was about the way we tend to demonize the things that we don't know or understand, or the people that we don't know or understand. Captain, you're aware of the Vulcan technique of the joining of two minds. You think you can get through that thing? possible. It was complicated because Bill Shatner's father died during the making of that episode and he had to go off to Florida to uh, deal with uh, the funeral and what have you. While he was gone, I was doing this contact with the Horda, doing this mind meld where I'm getting in touch with what it's experiencing and we have shot it and it's in pain and I'm, re I'm experiencing that pain with it and I'm I don't remember exactly how I did it, but something like pain, pain, something like that. It may be bigger than that. And Bill was not there. Pain! Now he came back two or three days later, and now it's time to put the camera on him. There was one shot where they shot across a double's shoulder. So you thought that Bill was in the scene while I'm doing that, but it was not Bill, it was a double. But now the camera has to turn around and we have to see Bill reacting to this. So he comes back and we turn the camera around on him. And he said, well, can Leonard show me what he did? I said, sure, I'll show you. So I walk over to the position and I, I, do, I said, it was something like this, Bill was pain, pain. And he said, uh, is that exactly the way you did it? I said, no, not exactly. Well, show me exactly what you did. Pain, pain. Now he said, let me, let me see what you really did. So I, pain, pain. And Bill is devilish, with a gleam in his eye, turns to the crew and says, would somebody give this guy an aspirin? He just sucked me right into it, you know, <laughs> having a good time with me. I want to kill him. <laughs> well, uh, Bill had that kind of a warped sense of humor. This is 13 years ago. The Enterprise. and its commander, Captain Christopher Pike. We were running short of scripts, and I used to watch the progress of the scripts through the story and teleplay procedure. I realized that we would soon be out of scripts to film, and if something didn't occur, we'd have to, quote, shut down, unquote. Oh my God, what a terrible thing to even contemplate. But that's what was going to happen. And at that time, I went to Gene, and uh, I don't know whether he knew it was coming or not. I said, Gene, either you write what, we, what he described as the envelope, or we shut down. Well, that was a job and a half. I worked on it very, very hard uh, to try and put new stuff with old stuff, because we couldn't waste that first pilot. So Gene said, make it work. It was a really tough job and one of the toughest jobs I think I've had. Mr. Spock had related to us your strength of will. We need the breathing space that two finished scripts can give us so we can get the rest of our shows done writing and into production. 
he could not face the issue. And he went home and he stayed in the office and he wrote for I don't remember how many days it was and he was delivered of the sandwich episodes. And we had two more scripts that we could use and we made it. We came within a week of failing to meet our air date. And that happened time after time that first season. Con is my name. Con, nothing else. Con. The original episode that I um, had the pleasure of, of, which I had the pleasure to work, Space Seed, God, so many years ago, I remember as being rather intimate. I remember having a very good eye to eye contact with Bill Shatner. The atmosphere was very pleasant. The text seemed to me, and it was ahead of its time. It was interesting to do. Captain, although your abilities intrigue me, you are quite honestly inferior, mentally, physically. In fact, I am surprised how little improvement there has been in human evolution. Oh, there has been technical advancement, but uh, how little man himself has changed. Khan was a super, superman, really. Superior strength, superior intellect. When it came to love, love became a very simple, beautiful thing to him. And that's what I found fascinating about the man. I have played many, many different kinds of roles because after I left MGM, I was um, left alone to fend from, by myself and support my family. So I had to do all kinds of things, including I did any number of television appearances. In every time, I portray a character never thinking that if he's a gangster or a killer, or, never thinking he's evil. I'm sure that the worst criminal in the world doesn't think of himself as being evil. I think perhaps I, I was able to achieve a certain, if not vulnerability, at least some kind of humanity in the character. You must excuse my whimsical way of fetching you here. But when I saw you passing by, I simply could not resist. Well, I got a call from Gene Kuhn, and I didn't know him. And I wondered, what is this guy calling me for? And he informed me that he had a part for me. But he wanted to talk to me first because there was a fellow by the name of Joe Agosta who was the casting, and he didn't think I could do it. He said, Bill Campbell is a tough guy from New Jersey, and uh, he's done a lot of war pictures, uh, Battle Cry, The Naked and the Dead, and things like that. He said, but I don't see him uh, in, in this part. He sends me this, this script, and I started reading it, and I said, holy Christ. I mean, this is a great role. An actor's dream. I digested it that night. I practically knew it by heart. If it's fighting that you want, you may have it. Are you challenging me to a duel? If you have the courage. Oh, this is better than I'd planned. I shall not shirk an affair of honor. Of all the things I've done, and I won't say one is better than the other, but in that group of all the series I've done, the uh, Star Trek episodes are the most fun uh, in my lifetime. I will never have another part like the Squire. Never. One day soon, man is going to be able to harness incredible energies, maybe even the atom. Energies that could ultimately hurl us to other worlds and in some sort of spaceship. I think uh, City on the Edge of Forever uh, was another very poetic, wonderful script by Harlan and Ellison, which I thought was very special, very good. Great love story for Bill Shatner with Joan Collins. And a script that did not have a happy ending. Uh, his love dies and he has to let it happen. Tragic ending in which he finally, he, I think his final line is, Let's get the hell out of here. It was good tragedy, if there is such a thing. Good dramatic construction, where the tragic event is in inevitable, has to happen. And uh, well written and, and well, uh, well produced and directed. 
I believe it was written that way. The awe that uh, it engendered wasn't. You know, we all were suitably impressed. And uh, I just remember the sh that, that setup where the three of them jumped through the hoop, so to speak, and disappeared into the past, or, you know, or possibly the future. It was, uh, it was an amazing moment. I imagine it came from the set description, but it was an odd looking thing. It, we called it, I think we called it the donut. And it was very mysterious looking. And uh, you know, you could really believe for the first time I felt that this is a true science fiction show. It had, but, the, but that episode had everything. And uh, it, it is rightfully so uh, the belief by most of the fans that it was the best episode of the whole three years of the series. Spark, I believe I'm in love with Edith Keeler. Jim, Edith Keeler must die. The best episodes of Star Trek reached for a universal something that resonated uh, a feeling that we all have. And uh, there, everybody's had the feeling, gosh, I wish I could go back and fix that. And of course you can't. And regret is the worst of human emotions because there's nothing you can do about it. So there we went back in time and tried to do something about it. Jim!